the audience would have been stunned. And if you can imagine that Jesus had a mic, you can imagine that he then asked this question and just dropped it. Okay? He asked this question. If your version of faith doesn't strike you as good news, then chances are it's not the same one as Jesus. Because Luke, throughout his account, he wants us to know that the kingdom of God, this idea of the good news of the kingdom of God that Jesus talks about, it's like nothing ever seen before. You see, the kingdom of God, so God's rule over earth and actually over an individual's life, Jesus showed us that it's inviting that it's relational, and it's without borders. Everybody's invited, and everybody is included. And Jesus lived a life that showed that. He showed that everybody has inherent worth. Everybody is made in the image of God. I'm going dark here and moody lighting for this. He showed everybody has inherent worth because everybody's made in the image of God. And he didn't just show it by the way that he lived. He actually taught his disciples to do the same as well. He wanted them to show that everybody has this inherent worth. In fact, Jesus has this encounter with a man and he teaches into this. And Luke records it in Luke 10. So he says this, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, Luke tells us those two things because he wants us to know, one is, this man's an expert in the law, so he knows his scriptures. So he's fairly high up in the ranking of religious people. Second thing is, this man's question, whatever it is, is not heartfelt. It's actually a test of Jesus. It's not 100% sincere. So the man asked this question, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, eternal life in the first century when this man was speaking and when Luke was writing, it didn't mean the same as we take it to mean now. So we take it to mean this idea of living forever. But in the first century, when the man's asking this question, what he's really asking is, he's asking about being part of God's future kingdom. So the experts testing Jesus is kind of like, well, what will Jesus say somebody needs to do in order to guarantee their place in God's future kingdom, in order to get their space at the table? Now, Jesus isn't silly. He knows that the man is testing him. And so he kind of spins it back onto the man. And he says this, what's written in the law, he said, how do you read it? So the expert, he recites back to Jesus something which lots of Jews would have learned as a child because it's kind of a a synopsis of the law. And so he says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Now this is a really important part of this account because earlier, you see, somebody had actually asked Jesus a very similar question. They'd asked him, What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus had answered, if we can see the next slide, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your strength, which is what they would have expected him to answer. But then he does something different. And he adds in at the end, he says, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And for the hearers that Jesus was speaking to, he was linking these two commandments. He's saying no longer do they stand in isolation of one another. They are combined. They're intrinsically linked. They're like two sides of the same coin because love for God is demonstrated by love for others. You see, faith and religion it isn't something we believe and we think in some kind of isolated vacuum. Our love for God should impact how we treat other people. Love for God is demonstrated by love for others. Well, apparently the expert had either been there when Jesus had said that or he had heard that Jesus had said that because he answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And you can kind of imagine Jesus smiling. He's like, hmm, somebody was listening when I was speaking. 
And so he said something that you virtually never hear Jesus say in any of the accounts of the Gospels. He turns to the man and he says, you've answered correctly. And you can just imagine the expert in the law, you know, he's feeling pretty good. I've answered this right. Jesus is a good teacher and he's told me I've got it right. And you can't blame him, would you? Like if we were asked a question by Jesus and we answered it and he said we got it correct, I know I'd be pretty like impressed with myself. And yet Jesus, he knows that what this man is doing. He knows it's a test of him. And he also knows our human propensity for pride. So actually what he wants to do is he wants to challenge the man. And he wants to challenge us because he wants us to know this isn't about knowledge. This isn't about knowing the correct answer. Instead, following Jesus is about a living active, dynamic faith, a faith that makes a difference to the choices that we make, the decisions and the actions that we have. So Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Do this, meaning love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And you'll have a reservation in the future kingdom of God because love for God is demonstrated by love for others. Now, for first century Judeans, which the man was, a neighbor would have been another Judean. Because as much as Jerusalem would have been a very ethnically diverse place, it was also a place where cultures and customs didn't really intermix, especially for Judeans. And for this man, a neighbor would have been another Judean. So what the man's actually asking is, Jesus, tell me, what subsection of the Judean community am I supposed to love like myself? What does that look like? But actually, that's not what God's kingdom is about, about liking and loving only the people who are like you. That's not what it looks like. So Jesus launches into one of the most disorientating, paradigm-shifting parables we hear him teach where the real question isn't, which subsection do I need to love? Instead, the real question is, what does real neighbor love look like? What does real neighbor love act like? So he tells what is one of the most famous stories ever. And it starts like this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. And you can almost feel the audience is now leaning in because, hang on, wait a second. Jesus, we were just talking about neighbors, and now we're talking about robbers? And we know this route. In fact, everybody knows this route. It's 17 miles. It's rocky. There's caves. There's desert. And it is a dangerous route. So this man, he's on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's been set upon by robbers. They've stripped him of his clothes because clothes were valuable back then. They beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, the audience would have known what was going to happen to this man next. They knew that actually if you were left for dead on this road, then two things would happen. Either the animals would come and eat you, or the sun would go down, and you would die of hypothermia because you'd get too cold. So Jesus continues, and he says, "'A priest happened to be going down the same road.'" And his audience would have thought, yes, great. Here comes the hero of the story. We know a priest is coming. He's the good guy. He knows God is going to do the right thing. But Jesus says, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, who was also another religious man. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by onto the other side. And you can kind of imagine the audience are going, huh? Because these guys are supposed to be the good guys. What is this story about, Jesus? How are you telling it? But actually, Jesus is very deliberate in how he tells it because he's made it very clear these two religious people are on their way from Jerusalem back to Jericho. So the audience would have known that these guys have already been to the temple. They've done their business at the temple, and actually they're coming back ceremonially clean with God. But they also know that the bruised and bleeding man who's been attacked by the robbers, he's going to be bloody. So if these guys, the priests and the Levites, stop, they're going to get his blood on them. And if they get his blood on him on them, due to the laws at the time, they would be seen as being unclean in front of God. 
So the audience would have known, these are supposed to be the good guys, but hang on a second, we can kind of see why they don't stop. Because if they stop, they're going to jeopardize what they understand their status to be with God. And so you can almost feel the tension that the audience would be feeling. They should stop, but we kind of understand why they don't stop. And then Jesus continues. But a Samaritan... And now the audience are feeling very uncomfortable because they're thinking, Jesus, don't tell me the priest and the Levi didn't stop, but the Samaritan, the Samaritan, a people group that we hate, we despise these guys because we think they've got it utterly wrong when it comes to God. We keep them as outcasts. They are our complete enemies. Don't tell us that you're going to do what we think you're going to do. But Jesus continues, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And the audience would have been like, no, you went there. You are going to make the Samaritan, the outcast, the person we hate, you're going to make him the hero of the story. But the disciples knew that it was even worse than that. Because the disciples knew, having heard Jesus tell parable upon parable, that actually in almost every parable that Jesus tells, there is somebody who represents God in the parable. And Jesus isn't just making the Samaritan the hero of the story. The Samaritan is going to be the God figure in this parable. Because the Samaritan is the one who goes above and beyond, no matter the conflict between him and the other person. So the story Jesus tells, it goes this. So the Samaritan went to the man and he bandaged his wounds. So the Samaritan, he doesn't care about being unclean before God. He cares about the person he can see in front of him. Then he poured on oil and wine, which would have cost him. It was an extravagance. Then the man put him on his own donkey, which meant that this man would have to walk alongside the donkey whilst the donkey carried the Samaritan. And then he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And Jesus' audience would have been thinking, wait, 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 wait. Don't tell me that this man stays the night to care for this man. And Jesus is like, yeah. Because this isn't a case of, I'm going to get you to help. But it's a case of, I am the help. Extravagant, costly, caring, compassionate. And Jesus goes on, he says, Then the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. And the audience are like doing their math, like, hang on a second, two denarii. Well, that would be the equivalent of about, that's the equivalent of two weeks stay. You're paying for the, the, the man who's injured to stay for two weeks in the inn. And Jesus is like, yeah, but even more than that. When I return, he says, the innkeeper, the The Samaritan says to the innkeeper, when I return, I will reimburse you any extra expense you may have when I come back. And the audience are like, hang on, you've done all this for this guy. Now you're paying for him to stay there for two weeks. And you're now going to return for a man you do not know. You're going to go back and check he's okay. And the audience would have been stunned. And if you can imagine that Jesus had a mic... You can imagine that he then asked this question and just dropped it. Okay? He asks this question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And you can almost imagine the tumbleweed that would have been going on. Because it's an inescapable question, isn't it? Because neighbor can no longer be about ethnicity or proximity or even do you like me or are you like me Jesus question forces me and you and his audience then and everybody everywhere to examine our hearts to examine our prejudices our contempt for folks who don't look like us and who don't behave like us who maybe don't even believe the same things as us, don't act like us, don't worship like us, don't vote like us, who basically are nothing like us. Maybe they don't even like us. Maybe we really don't like them. And the question Jesus asks actually isn't so much who was a neighbor, because Jesus has already said that actually how we treat our neighbor is a reflection 
of how we love God. So the implication behind the question is, which of these three men really loved God? Which of them loved God with all of their hearts and souls and mind and strength by loving a stranger? It's the one who had mercy on him, like the man answered. The one who saw a need and met it. The someone that saw that there was something that needed to to be done and that they could do it, and they did it. And he didn't talk himself out of it. And he wasn't constrained by prejudice or opinions or pride. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. You see, if you want to live your life in sync with God's activity in this world, if you actually say that you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then go and do that. Love without boundaries or excuses or prejudices. Stop when you see a need and actually meet the need. When there's something you know that you can do, do it. No excuses. Don't talk yourself out of it. Just go and do it. Because love for God is demonstrated by our love for other people and for all people. Because everybody is made in the image of God. Absolutely no exceptions. That person who hurt you and you cannot forgive them and they've done something so terrible, they are made in the image of God. And God loves them. And because God loves them, he wants us to love them too. See, Jesus doesn't need any more admirers. He's got enough admirers. Jesus doesn't actually need any more people to believe in him. He never needs us to believe in him like that somehow makes him more powerful. What Jesus really needs and wants is people who are going to follow his example, people who are going to actively do, who will stop and help and do something when they know that they can do something. If we love God, then loving him looks like this. It means stopping and helping people in need for the simple reason that it is what God does.